Number 10, sale, lease, or transfer cemetery lots does not require a license. Now, the word that bothers me in that sentence is the word lease. You know, maybe that's where the walking dead come from. You, out. <laughs> um, any act of a broker who was licensed in another state that is granted by the Real Estate Commission can do real estate here as well. So all of these people are exempt from having a license. Now, what does it take to get a license? And these are the items that, we're, that you guys are experiencing right now. To get a broker's license as an individual, you have to be 18 years of age and cannot have a conviction for an act that would constitute grounds of disciplinary sanction by us, a, a crime that has a direct bearing on your competency to practice, or a crime that indicates that you have a propensity to endanger the public. You guys know what that means? I don't either, all right? They left it very vague so that they could probably make a case-by-case -case decision. So what they don't like, if you apply for a license and you have been convicted of something that would immediately put you on suspension in our commission, they may not give you a license. If you've been convicted of something with the competency and any of financial crime, if you have been convicted of fraud, uh, embezzlement, forgery, those are crimes that you won't get for. If you have been convicted of something to endanger the public, I am not really sure what that would be. I know that I had a gentleman several years ago came to me and said, hey, look, now that we're covering this, I really need to tell you that I spent five years in prison for the possession of cocaine. So I called the state commission and they said, well, we're not gonna make this decision until he makes the application. He actually made the application. They called him in front of the board. He explained his scenario. Hey, 20 years ago, I was young and stupid. I went to jail. Uh, I've been clean ever since, never gotten in any trouble and they gave him his license, all right? Now, there was a young lady that had a, an, uh, an arrest for breaking and entering. They did not issue her a license. That is definitely a trust issue. She was entering into houses. I would imagine that they said probably something like, you know, why break into house? Here's a key, just unlock it, lock, no. So, they did not give her her license, all right? You gotta have a GED or better. You must have completed a broker course, which is what you're doing. You've gotta pass a written exam, which is what you hope to do. You have to make application to the state. Now, here's another thing that a lot of people assume. If you pass the state exam, you are not licensed. Passing the state exam merely allows you to make the application for your license. And if you've been convicted of one of those other things up there, they may deny your application. So when you take your exam in a couple of weeks, you will take two tests. You're gonna take one on the general body and one on state laws that we are covering now. When you're done, it's going to ask you four or five more questions. Did you attend an approved school? Yes, you did. How many hours did you take? 90. Have you been convicted of any of these crimes? No. Did you get solicited for employment during class? You should write no because you never have, all right? If you submit those five questions and they are all what the state calls clean, then your application is pretty much a rubber stamp, all right? If you put, yes, I have been arrested like John did, 
yes, I was arrested. They will then say, come to talk to us and you will get to go in front of the commission and the commission will ask you questions and then they will literally vote right there. What do you think? I don't know, what do you think? I think yay. All in favor say aye, aye. Give him his license, all right? So at the beginning of each meeting, Deanna Alexander, the executive director, will start each meeting and the chairman will say, do we have any biz licenses before us? And she literally will say, yes, I've got 13 applications. And they will do it all in one fell swoop. Are there, is there anything we need to know about those applications? And she will say, no, they're all clean. Okay, all in favor say aye, aye, aye. Give them all their license, all right? That's so making application is a formal process, but if your application is clean, then it's really just a rubber stamp. But you literally have to make the application. You just don't get granted a license from passing. And on that application is where you would get me as a managing broker or whoever you're going to, to sign off on it, to accept the responsibility for you. If you submit your application without a broker, they will say, sorry, this is not a completed application, all right? And you have to do all of this stuff, the application within one year of passing the exam. So there are two time frames here. From the day you finish course to the day you take the exam, you have one year, all right? And then from the day you pass the exam to the day you make application to the state, you also have one year. So theoretically, between the day you end the course and the day you make application, you could almost stretch that out to two years in time frame. I would not suggest that, but you theoretically could, all right? I know those are questions on the exam. One year between each one of them. Course to test and test to application. Now, if you wanna create a, get a license as a partnership, Say we're gonna start a business and our, we wanna create a legal partnership. If they, if they to issue a partnership license, all of, the bro, all of the people in the partnership have to be a broker. One of them has to be an Indiana resident and is a managing broker. And the partnership must make sure that all of the people that are doing licensed required activities are actually licensed as well. And they will pay a fee to get a partnership license. If you want to be a corporation, then one of the members of the corporation has to be an Indiana resident and has to be a managing broker. Notice the difference. In a partnership, if all of us were going to start a partnership today, legally we couldn't because you guys don't have a license. In a partnership, all the members have to have a license, all the partners. In a corporation, we could start because only one of us has to have a license in the corporation and you would all look at me and go, okay, Raymond, you've got a license. You're going to be our uh, Indiana resident and the managing broker. Thumbs up. If you want to start an LLC and get a LLC license, and I've told you that the Real Estate Monkey LLC has got a license. So I carry an LLC license as well, as well as my individual license. If you want to start an LLC, 
Note, there are two types of LLCs. There is what they call a member managed, and then there is one that is called a manager managed LLC. A member managed is where one of the members of the LLC is the manager of it. A manager managed is where the LLC hires a professional manager to manage the LLC. If it is a member managed, then all of us have to be a licensed broker in that LLC. One of us has to be an Indiana resident and they will be the managing broker if they qualify. If it is a manager managed, then only one of them need to be, and it has to be an Indiana resident who is a managing broker. So you kind of got four things going. You got a partnership, you've got a, a corporation, and then you've got these two types of LLCs. The partnership and the member managed, every person has to be broker. In the corporation and a manager managed, only one has to be a broker. Those partnership licenses can get revoked or expired based upon if it's what, which one it is. So for example, in a partnership, if any of us in a partnership lose our license, we lose the partnership license. Everybody see this. This actually is a lot easier understood than it is to be explained. Since all of us in a partnership are brokers, if just one of us get in trouble, then all of a sudden, not all of us are brokers, right? So we lose our partnership license as well. Same thing with a member managed or manager managed. If it's a corporation, all of the brokers would have to lose their license for us to lose our license. So think about that and it actually makes a lot of sense because if you're in a partnership and one loses their license, then obviously not all of us are licensed. So it only takes one to kill the spoil the pot. In a corporation, if one of us loses our license, then we just make the other licensed person it. So we all would have to lose our license or get them revoked before the corporation license goes away. Letter F, licenses are granted just like they are to an individual. So they expire the same time that an individual license expires. They expire every three years. Our license are good for three years. This year, um, this year, is the year to renew our license. June the 30th of 2020 is the last day for this license. All of us in the state have to renew, including me, including my corporation, because they all expire. We will get one on July the 1st of 2020, and it will go way out till 2023 is our next licensing. When you guys get your license, depending on how close it is to the June timeframe, they may just go ahead and give you the new one so that you won't be re-upping in 30 days. All right, but they are three years in length. Um, unless the license it expires, it has to be renewed every three years. Letter J is the law that people want to ask about all of the time. A partnership, corporation, or limited liability may not be a broker. It can only be a managing broker. So you guys, I get people all the time that come to me and say, I want to get a corporation. 
and so you pay my corporation. I can't do that. Your corporation is not licensed. You are. Well, I'll just get one of them partnership licenses. No, letter J says a broker cannot, or a corporation cannot be a broker. They can only be a managing broker. So I would pay you personally, not to any kind of corporation that you have. Now, it doesn't matter because you've got the protection of me from the corporation and any expense you incur as an independent contractor is also the tax deductible. All right. There can be non-residents that get a license. The non-resident, like a Kentucky person, might want an Indiana license so that they can practice right over the river. Richmond, Terre Haute, Evansville, Fort Wayne, South Bend, all of those people may want to practice in Indiana. They can be issued what's called a non-resident license. To do that, they have to do several things. They must file a letter with the commission called a written consent to suit. This means a lawsuit. What this is saying, if you live in Kentucky and you're practicing in Indiana and you do something wrong in Indiana, you can't just say, well, screw it. I'll never go back to Indiana. I'll just stay in Kentucky and practice. No. This irrevocable consent to suit says you agree as part of this licensing that if you get in trouble in our state, you will actually come to the hearings to defend yourself. It is an irrevocable consent, which means an agreement to a lawsuit. You agree to participate and come back to Indiana should you need to. That form just basically states that they will follow the Indiana laws and trial procedure, not the state you're coming from. And this non-resident license can be exempt as long as the place you are moving from to here is virtually, you are licensed in that state and the requirements for your license in that state are virtually the same as they are here. This is the reciprocity thing that we have talked about. People in North Carolina can come to Indiana and get in Indiana if they're moving here and won't have to go through school as long as several things happen as long as they are licensed in that state, as long as they pass, have the same degree of licensing and that their requirements are similar to us. That's all that that is saying. 